I want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south as we bring you the word of His glory today. Today's uh, message is in, we continue our series in the book of Isaiah. Tonight we'll be in Isaiah 33. And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living word of God, which is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Okay, the prophet Isaiah giving us 33. We're going to talk, um, to kind of put this in perspective, Isaiah is talking about the six woes that are going to come in uh, Isaiah 33. And this is uh, Sennacherib, uh, the leader of the Assyrians. And uh, Hezekiah, one of the godly kings, was trying to buy the, the Assyrians off, and that was not working. And uh, the Assyrians were taking over land uh, like locusts, as the Lord says through Isaiah. And uh, they were, it, we see in Isaiah, where, uh, earlier in Isaiah, where they, where they come up and they're threatening them uh, to uh, annihilate the, to Judah. And we see what God does in the end. God, God uh, they, they take trust in, their, in their, the, the mighty God. And they, they were even uh, exposed saying, you know, look at all the gods that the Assyrian king has taken over. Those, those gods are nothing. Your, what is your God? Your, what is your God, Elohim? He is certainly no different than any of the other gods of the, of the, of the nations that this uh, Assyrian nation has, has conquered. And we're going to see not only does God uh, respond, but Sakharnev dies in the temple of his God, who he claimed was bigger than the one God, the true God, Elohim, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, killed by his sons. And we see that how powerful angels are, angels of the Lord. One night, as we see um, in 2 Kings 18, 13 through 15, one night, 185,000 Assyrians were killed by one angel of the Lord. That's how mighty God is. That's why we fear God. That's why we love God and give him all of us because he, his way is the only way. And uh, 185,000 snapped up like that. That's how powerful the I am that I am is Elohim, Yahweh, the one and only true God in three. Okay, Isaiah 33, one. Woe to you who plunder, though you have not been plundered. You who deal treacherously, though they have not dealt treacherously with you, which they will. Revenge will come on them. Not only God does it to the leader, but you're going to see how the Assyrians were taken over by the Babylonians and history repeats itself. Exactly the way the scripture said. God told you, tells us in the beginning how each of the different nations will fall. And uh, he said, who deal treacherously, though they have dealt treacherously with you. When you cease plundering, you will be plundered. So once they stop their massive thing, they will be plundered, and, and they were. When you make an end of dealing treacherously, they will deal treacherously with you, saying, an eye for an eye, your time is coming, and I will protect my beloved Judah for David's sake. That's the everlasting covenant. I will protect Jerusalem for King David. Because this promise to David is an everlasting promise, the Davidic covenant. O Lord, be gracious to us, O Jehovah. We have waited for you. Be there, our, be there arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. So they're calling out to the Lord. Remember, Hezekiah uh, did a lot of the good things right. Um, and, you know, he did get prideful and show the Babylonians his... Uh, all, all the gold in the temple, which was not a smart move that Isaiah told him later on. But he did repent, and he did seek the Lord's face. And we know that uh, Hezekiah uh, had love for the Lord, and he did tear down the high places, and he did praise the Lord, and he sought the Lord's face in this time of trouble. And it well, went well, even to the point of his death. Isaiah gave him a prophecy that he would die because of the sickness. And, he, and he, he prayed. He prayed in earnest to the Lord with all his heart, his soul, and his mind. And the God heard him and said he would give him 15 more years. And so he was alive 15 more years. So in noise and tumult, the people shall flee. When you lift up yourself, the nation shall be scattered. So the nation will become scattered as we see when it happens when the Babylonians come in and the nations will be scattered when the next time comes up that there will be a king the most high king, Jesus Christ, comes back to kill, to, to bring in the last true judge, judgment in the end time in the book of Revelation and we see in the book of Daniel. And it will be the Assyrian again. It will be the rebuilt Assyrians from Babylon. As it says in Jeremiah 51, the Babylonian empire will be rebuilt. The Assyrian empire will be rebuilt. And the lawless one we know from the scripture is an Assyrian. 
So that's what will happen with the Lord Most High through His Son, Jesus Christ. And your plunder shall be gathered like the gathering of caterpillar and the running to and fro of locusts. He shall run upon them. So showing that he's, he's, he's taking on and just engulfing uh, these nations like locusts will go in and engulf the, the, the produce of the fields. That's how powerful the Assyrians were and thought they were. And they got haughty and thinking that their God and their might was more powerful than the one true God, Elohim. And God takes his name very serious. And he takes his city, his city very serious. He takes his people that are called by his name serious. And that's just not the remnant of the Jews. That is every single person from east to west to north to south that call on the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ. We've been adopted into the kingdom family and we can be called sons and daughters of the most high God. What a great, great gift of, of grace that is. Praise his name. He's a loving God, but he's a fierce God and his ve vengeance is true and his ven vengeance is just as we'll see. And the Lord, Jehovah exalted, for he, will, he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. And that Zion, sitting on the hill of Zion, will be our King of kings and the Lord of, uh, Lord of righteousness. That, as it says here, justice and righteousness. Jesus will come in the order of Melchizedek. Lord, he'll be called Lord of righteousness. Melchizedek, as we talked in the book of Yasser, Melch means king. And Melchizedek uh, is King and Lord of Righteousness is what the title will be of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, when he comes down and literally sits on the throne of Jerusalem in the mercy seat to, to bring in the Davidic covenant. And King David will be resurrected and be the king of Israel again, we see in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of Jehovah is treasure. Yes, God wants us to love him with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. But we also fear him two ways. The first fear is knowing how powerful he is, that he could take Sodom and Gomorrah and wipe them out like that, that he could take one angel, just one regular angel, didn't say it was a mighty archangel like Michael. It was one angel, took out 185,000 Assyrians in one night. That's how powerful our God is, and we should fear how, how powerful and how mighty he is. But the real fear is also the fear of love. The fear that we love him so much that we don't ever want to, 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 to let him down and send nature. We fear, we fear that we might come short of his glory. And that's why we have to accept Jesus Christ to take our sins past, present, and future. And know the Lord loves us so much and that we have that love for him. And we also have that fear that we want to make sure that we're doing the right things right for him, for his glory, because of love. So fear can drive love. But love is the central thing of all. Jesus says, what are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he went and talked about the Samaritan. As love your, love your enemy as yourself. So we as Christians, we love all our enemies. And we want each and every one that do not believe in a God or believe in a false God or another God or another religion. We pray for them. We don't have animosity towards them. We're not trying to kill them. We are trying to love them and be the light in this, this world that is melting down and give them that joy, peace, hope that can only come through the Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, on, we pray for them and not pray on them. P-R-E versus P-R-A. And uh, so that's what we look for. And Jesus says, all the law and the prophets are wrapped up in love. If you want to sum up the 66 books of God's word, it's love. It's how much he loves us and how far he went for that love. And he shows us history before history happens. Why does God do that? Because he wants, he, he, as it says in, the, in, in prophecy, God does not do anything unless he tells his prophets first. And God wants us to walk hand in hand with him. God wants us to know what's, what's uh, in front of us. We know that we have, a, we have a home on the high and we take rest assured that his word is truth and what, what he says is true. We know Revelation 22, how it ends. If we believe in Jesus Christ and we're obedient to him and accept him as Lord and Savior, we have eternity. We have eternity with God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit forever. No more hurt, no more pain, no more. And it's beautiful. It is absolute paradise. And that's what we have to look forward in his name's sake. Surely the valiant ones shall a cry outside. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. There won't be any peace. It will be at the sword. The sword as it came to the Assyrians, the 185,000 were killed by an angel of the Lord. 
the, the, the death of their leader in, the, in his own temple by his own God, so-called God, the God was of nothing. There's only one God. His name is Elohim. And there's only one other God who tries to be like the Most High God, and that's Satan. Satan has changed the name of who he wa is and was all through the years, whether he's been Baal or Merdok or Molech or um, any of the names, Dagon, and you could go Asterisk, and you name them over and over and over again. Satan just counterfeits the Trinity. Why is it shown in the, in the Scripture in Hebrew? Um, that when it's referring to a false god as the word Elohim, remember we teach that Elohim is not only the true God, the one God, but it means three. So why does the word Elohim be used in a reference of a false god? So there's three. That Satan always through the history of the world, ever since he, the falling, starting with Nimrod, has always tried to emulate and be like the most high God as we see in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. So, uh, Satan is a type of, is, is trying to be like God the Father. And he always has an antichrist or a lawless one that he uses on the world, like Nimrod, to be a, 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 a like Christ. That's why it's called antichrist. It will be against Christ, but yet will act like a pseudo Christ, like he is Christ, try to fool the world. And the third is he tries to manipulate the Holy Spirit through his demonic spirits, through the false prophet in Revelation 22. So Satan uses the Elohim and the faults, the falseness in Satan's home. He already knows where he's going. His demons even know where they're going. We see in the Gospels when Jesus comes to the, to, to the, to the area of, of, of Legion in the Golan Heights area, Bashan. What, what are you to do with us, the son of the most high God? It is not our time yet. They know where their time is, and they know where they're going. They're going to the lake of fire for eternity. Satan knows where his ultimate home is. That's why he's panicking today. People ask, why is the world melting down? It's because Satan knows that it is the last days, and he is trying to wreck and destroy as many as he possibly can for that day of the Lord that he comes before it's too late. Because he knows once the certain elements of the prophecy fulfill, the church raptured, Harpazo, that he has seven years left, and then he's taken and thrown into the abyss until, until the end of the thousand, year, uh, thousand years. For a season, he's let loose, and then the white throne books are open, and then Satan is thrown to the lake of fire with his demons. He knows where his ultimate home is, and he's trying to deceive, distract, lie, do anything he possibly can to have you accept any, anything or anyone other than the one way, the only way, the truth the way, the truth, and the life, and that is our Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The highways lie waste. The traveling man ceases. He, was broken. He, he has broken the covenant. He has despised the city. He regards no man. There's wo six woes. Again, six, there's six woes towards the Assyrian leader here. Six is always a number of man. That's why the number 666, people always, get that one, if you don't follow the Bible, everybody's heard of the number 666. It's the trinity of, the, of man. And that's what it means, 666. It also represents, in the time of Solomon, that was the, the, the monetary, it was 666 talents that were re required to come to the, the treasury from all over the world. So six is a number of man, and it also is a, a symbolism of a commerce. We see in the, in the days of, of, of the new Babylon that will come with the Assyrian, that Babylon will be a commerce place, and the number 666 will be initiated with that where Christ and God the Father are the, the three sevens, and that's completion, the completion of all the things that we've had to go through, the trials and tribulations. That's what six means. Now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Uh, I mean, skip uh, verse nine. The earth mourns in languish. Lebanon is shamed and shriveled. Sharon is like a wilderness, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruit. Literally did that. Um, now I will rise, says Jehovah. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. He will be exalted. The one name, the one God, whose word is above his name. His name is Elohim, the I am that I am. God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit praise his name. You shall con conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire, you shall devour you. Fire judgment. Christ will come in the second judgment. The first judgment was the water judgment where, where uh, God gave the covenant of the rainbow to Noah that he would not flood the earth again. But the second and last judgment is the fire judgment where Jesus comes as a wrath. That's why his, 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 his bronze feet 
in, in the book of Daniel. Bronze is the only element that can withstand fire. Fire, for the fire judgment's coming. And out of his mouth will become fire of the sword, the two-edged sword, the word of God. Uh, it shall bring forth stubble your breath as fire shall devour you. Literally. It's not a figure of speech. Fire will come out of his mouth. And people sh shall be like the, the burnings of lime, like thorns cut up that shall be burned in the fire. Hear you who are far off what I have done, and you who are near, acknowledge my might. He said, the world will acknowledge my might. Me, the one, the true, the only God, the God Elohim, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the God above all gods. Every other God was a... a, a, a uh, a formation of Satan trying to deceive. The sinners are in Zion are afraid. The fearlessness has seized the, the hypocrites. Who among you should dwell with the devouring fire? Who among you should dwell with the everlasting burning? There's no hiding. He says those who are sinners in, the, the, the sinners in Zion are afraid. The fearful are the hypocrites that know that justice is going to be served. And the King of Kings and the Lord of hosts is coming back to redeem Redeem the remnant that are called by his name, that have given their heart, their soul, and their mind to the one God through his son, Jesus Christ. He will dwell, he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppression, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of the bloodshed and shouts his eyes from seeing evil. Stand up, walk the way of the Lord. We are called to be beacons of light like Christ. And we walk in his truth. We walk in his light. And we walk in his word. And we are obedient to his word so that we can fulfill what Isaiah is telling us in Isaiah 33, 15. To be like, walk the way of Christ. Not for ourselves, but for the glory of the Lord. To be humble. To give ourselves as a light to the rest of the world. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be a fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Jesus is the bread. He is the bread of life and his water is sure, the living water, and he is the rock. He is the foundation. He is the cornerstone. He has been shown us, to us, over and over again in the Old Testament that the coming day of God's Son, the King, the King of Kings, the Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ. Your heart will be med meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Oh, I'm sorry, verse 17. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that's very far off. The king in his beauty, the beauty of the most high. Your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Where is the weights? Who is who counter the towers? No, justice will be served. God knows of the hearts and he knows the deeds and all works will be evaluated. You will not see fierce people, a people of obscure, of obscure speech beyond perception of stammering tongue that you cannot understand. So you remember the Tower of Babel, God destroyed the, 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 the communication. There's one language up until then, but Nimrod, who was the first antichrist, Satan used Nimrod literally to be against God. And if you read the book of Yasser, even though it's not canon, we see it goes deeper than what we see in Genesis. We know that Nimrod was a, it says a mighty warrior. Uh, it's mistranslated in, our gen, in Genesis as like, a mighty warrior of the Lord. That's, it's not what it says in Hebrew. He was, he was a warrior against Jehovah. He was against Elohim. He was an antichrist. That was Satan using a man as a, the first antichrist. And God destruct, destruct, changed the languages at, at the Tower of Babel. And the, we're going to see that we're going to go back to one language again like it was before uh, Satan fell and the sin came into the world. We will be speaking one language and that language will be in the pure Hebrew. And when you read the, the, in Yasser what Nimrod was doing, he wasn't building that tower to show how great he was and his, 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 his uh, earthly might. Yeah, the book of Yasser tells us a little farther that Nimrod was literally trying to build a tower up to the high level of God and try to assassinate God. That's how crazy and insane Nimrod is and was. And that is the way Satan is and was. And we have to be careful of that, of, of that great deceiver, that great destruction. Uh, look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. The festivals, and remember there's seven festivals in the city of Jerusalem. We're going to do a uh, Hebrew seven festivals on, on Facebook Live tonight at 8, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time because uh, God takes these very seriously, these, these, these Hebrew feasts, and he, does, he, he works on his own calendar. He works on these feast days. 
Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. That's the last of the seven festivals is the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is the end after the thousand year reign. Christ will come down as the day of atonement when he comes in and makes justice in the world and, and, and he comes as the Goel, the blood redeemer and the kinsman redeemer. That would be the day of atonement. And then the last is the tabernacle with the Lord forever and eternity. So he says the tabernacle, no one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. Remember the Lord says in the, in the, in the law, in the Torah, do not move the stakes of somebody's property. That was against the law. <clears throat> so you couldn't unlawfully enlarge your territory by just moving your neighbor's stakes to make your, law, your, uh, <clears throat> your land look bigger. God is saying, the stakes have been set since the foundation of the world, and the land that I gave to the 12 tribes of Israel will stand, and no one will take those stakes. My everlasting covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land covenant, will be forever. And my everlasting covenant with my beloved David, the Davidic covenant, will be forever. And it will, they will both be ushered in by the King of kings and the Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ. Praise his name. Verse 21, but their majestic Lord, Jehovah, will be for us, a place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley and with oars will sail, no maj majestic ships pass by. You read that and you think, well, what's he talking about? Just fluttery of words? No, he's telling us that um, th the Lord will come in, uh, in, 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 the, in the new uh, for everlasting life. Remember we see in Revelation 22 that there will be no sun and moon anymore because the light, the, 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 the Shekinah light of God the Father, Jesus Christ, will light the universe. He will be, he's literally light. He is literally going to light the universe. And we also see the sea is gone because the sea is an idiom of the second death, the final death to sin to the lake of fire. And yes, it's a lake of fire. It's a fire judgment. That's why Jesus is coming down with, with, with fire out of his mouth. And it's showing us here what? That there will be rivers, but there will be no sea. God has taken away sea in eternity. So there's no majestic ships going on in the big sea. At verse 22, for Jehovah is our judge. One judge, that's Jehovah, his name Elohim. The, the Jehovah is our lawgiver. He gave us his law. He gave us his precepts, his commandments. They're called his word. And he is the word, the literal word. The Lord, Jehovah, is our king. Yes, he has to be the king in the lion of the lion of the tribe of Judah out of the line of King David for the Davidic covenant. I will have a king in the order of David forever, so thus says the Lord, and it shall be. Remember when Judah, or Jacob, was giving his, his, in Genesis, he was giving his prophecy to the 12 tribes. He says, the scepter shall not leave uh, Judah until Shiloh comes. Well, what does that mean? Shiloh is an Old Testament uh, reference to the Messiah. Saying this, and the scepter is showing you the, the authority of the rod of the kingship showing you that kingship would come out of the line out of the line of Judah and the symbol of of Judah was the lion and out of that came king David David's line forever and the scepter shall not leave until Shiloh comes meaning the scepter will never leave the kingship until the messiah comes and when the messiah comes the second time the lord almighty jesus christ he is the king of kings and the lord of hosts forever all through scripture, it points to this magnificent day. You're, you're, um, so the Lord, Jehovah is our king. He will save us. He will save us. Not save us from harm or save us from, from fear. This is a literal save. He's saving our soul. This is your soul and your spirit that you're dealing with. Your soul and spirit live on forever. Even scientists today have shown you, even though they're atheists, will show you that the soul and the spirit live on after the death. And the body will go to the to the ground, but the soul and spirit, even even secular scientists tell us that they live on. But where do they go? They can only go two places. If you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your soul and spirit live on with the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost forever, until so your resurrected body comes at the harpazo, and with the resurrection, the catch up, as Paul says in Thessalonica, or. You deny the Christ, or you deny anything, you accept anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever wonder why Satan gets so upset with Jesus Christ? You ever wonder why demons just shriek in the name of Jesus Christ? They don't shriek in any other name. 
And Satan is never fearful of any other name but Jesus Christ. He'll never give glory to Jesus Christ because Satan knows the scripture. The demons know the scripture. It's through the way of the Lord. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. They know it. And they know that day of reckoning is coming. And those who deny the name because of the deceit, distraction, or whatever happens of why you did it, you'll see your name removed from the Lamb's Book of Life. You'll see your world, your deeds and your works. And you'll see the times that you've had the opportunity to accept the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, and you didn't for whatever reason, whether it's hardening of his heart or tradition or whatever it was. And that punishment will be a like punishment of what you did for the second death. And that is in the lake of fire for eternity. Verse 23, your tackle is loose. They could not strengthen their mass. They could not spread the sail because there is no sea anymore. It's just the living water and the rivers and streams. Then they prey on great plunder is divided. The lame take the prey. And closing out in verse 24, and the inhabitant will not say I'm sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. The people say, won't say I'm sick. What does that mean? There will be no more sickness. There will be no more cancer. There will be no more deathly illness. There will be no more colds. There will be no, nothing but absolute perfection and love and peace and harmony with the most high God is the way he wanted it in the beginning. That's why our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And it's only to those who deny his name that they were removed because God's goal from the beginning of time was that every single man, woman, child ever born would have relationship with, with him, intimacy through him and his son and the Holy Spirit for eternity. And it breaks his heart when he sees those who, 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 who choose something else. And as it says in the scripture, the Lord does not delight in the death of the wicked. No, He's, it saddens him that they got it so wrong and their heart was so hard and that they're incurably wicked. Our hearts are born incurably wicked, as it says in the book of Jeremiah. And the only thing to save that sickness of incurably wicked heart is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, giving your heart, your soul, and your mind to him. And we're installed a new heart, a heart that lives in the spirit forever with him for his glory. Praise his name. And the iniquity will be forgiven forever. Once Christ died on that cross, for every single person ever born, if we accept him as Lord and Savior, we accept him as Lord and Savior, and we repent of our sins and be obedient to him, our sins are washed away. As it says here in 33, your sins, your iniquity are forgiven forever. Praise his name. That's the end of Isaiah 33. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you until next time. God bless.